Oh, uh, here we are. Welcome to everybody. Actually, we will wait for the other speakers. Uh, moment. Welcome, Melissa. Welcome, uh, uh, Loreto. Good morning for you. Uh, no, good afternoon for you. For me, it's good morning. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, actually, yeah, we have uh, the same problem. We don't know the time <laughs> of uh, the yeah. other. So, good day or good morning, afternoon, evening. Yeah. Some colleagues actually in the last session uh, were presenting during their night at midnight. Oh, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there's a sort of uh, jet lag. Uh, yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah, we have five hour of difference. No? Five hour, Ten yeah. Difference. yeah. For me, it's 9 uh, 13 a.m. Huh? Oh, yeah. Welcome. Uh, okay, let me change uh, the name. I'm uh, Andrea Guazzini, and I'm a researcher at the University of Florence here in Italy. So, yeah, and uh, so welcome uh, again, uh, Daniel. Nice to meet you again. Uh, welcome, Hi, Dean. Welcome, uh, uh, Laura. Uh, in this session, uh, entitled uh, The Role of Community Psychology in Health Promotion, and actually, after a pandemic, I would say that is a quite update <laughs> session, unfortunately, after. Hopefully, after uh, the worst uh, phase of, uh, of the last pandemic. And uh, I, as you can uh, see, uh, we enlarged the, the session in order to reach one hour and a half. And so to, to, to try to have uh, uh, some time for the questions after the presentation. So I would like to propose to you to try to have uh, the, for the speakers to uh, present uh, your work in 10 minutes. I will support you saying, uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, reminding the time, uh, the, the time uh, that uh, would remain. And uh, after each presentation, we'll try to have five minutes for questions. Uh, uh, of course, uh, questions, uh, uh, in the chat during the, the talks are very welcome. So to be able uh, possibly to, to propose them at the same time to the speakers. So to give uh, her or him the possibility to build an answer uh, intertwining uh, all the questions. And if you agree, I... Uh, we, we are going to have uh, two videos uh, because two colleagues uh, uh, are not uh, uh, going to be able to be with us. Uh, but if no one uh, has uh, some trouble, some uh, time constraints, I would follow the, the, the original program. And uh, so I would invite, uh, I don't know if, they are still with us. And Gobile Nomonde Somi or Jacqueline Akburst. I think that uh, they're not uh, with us yet. So I will, uh, I would like to go to the second contribution from uh, uh, Professor Leila and uh, which uh, is entitled Core Components of a National Community-Based Mental Health Intervention. And the Professor Leva is from the University, uh, uh, the University of Chile. And uh, uh, we can see you perfectly, hear you perfectly. Yeah. I don't know if you can share your screen. Uh, okay. Here. Okay. You can see my um, my screen, no? Yes, yeah? perfectly, perfectly. Oh, 
Okay. okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Good morning for me. <laughs> but I'm Lorito Leiva from University of Chile. This uh, work has been done by me and Fernanda Sanchez. Uh, today, I like to talk about core component of a national community-based mental health intervention. A quick background, uh, over the last few years, the field of school mental health has expanded in connection with promotional and preventive initiatives. This is because schools are community setting that provide a suitable context for solving issues related to the psychological well-being of children and adolescents. In the implementation of psychosocial programs, such as school mental health intervention, it's possible to see substantial difference in the result obtained, even when um, even when the same objectives is pursued um, through the same design, it's essential for us to understand that intervention are implemented in educational community by different professionals, which may affect the execution due to the lack of shared competencies. The evidence in indicate that for an intervention to succeed and achieve the expected result, certain elements must be present in a security team. Implementation science has made it possible to investigate this by classifying the component in the intervention into core or peripheral. A, the aim of this study was focused on identifying identify and systematizing the core component of the skill for life programs at Chilean nationwide preventive mental health intervention in the school. Uh, a little common core components are defined as essential or core principles associated with the activity of an intervention, which are considered necessary to produce the desired benefits. Or regarding all method and procedure, uh, this is a qualitative study. The design was descriptive and sequential, and it used a sample of 31 interviews from members of the team chair of a public school mental health program. The interviews uh, were designed using the consolidated framework for implementing research and the, inform the information retrieved was analyzed using direct content analysis. Um, regarding our result and discussion, the result showed seven essential components structured in three main categories. The first one is uh, elements associated with implementation condition and beneficiaries. Uh, among these elements, there are um, three uh, dimensions. The first one is the need. In this case, the needs refer to the fact that the implementing team, but also the literature, show that the team implemented the program according to the local needs and the meaning given by the community itself to each factor of the intervention. Another point is government policies. The discourse of the executive team showed that it's necessary to have a clear public policies which support the intervention and make them visible to the community. Finally, the implementation climate is especially relevant. The ability, the ability to prepare for and accept change. This means the willingness to accept modification is a point of great relevance for the skill for life teams. Another central element is the element associated with how implement. Um, here we find the dimension of leaderships and network and communication. In the case of leadership, evidence has shown that leadership is a component that influences the student achievement, the implementation and result of intervention program, and the school climate. According to the implementing team, the greater the presence of leadership, the greater the value placed on the intervention. 
Feeling validated by the leader is fundamental because they approval allows the security team to fully develop their work, both technically and creatively, generating healthy and empowering workspace. Another relevant uh, dimension is network and communication. Research has found that strengthening network generate more effective and synergistic action. The last one is the element associated with implementation. Specifically, we refer to the dimension of adaptation and reflection and evaluation, in particular adaptation, the implementation team frequently relate the need to make the program more flexible, uh, to make sense in their context with uh, research understand as ecological relevance, and which make the intervention possible in different settings. Since it generates articulation between the design and the reality of the intervention. Uh, the second one is the reflection and evaluation. The literature of code component proposed them as central as priority acts. The implementing team point out that while reflection is done spontaneously, evaluation is usually governed by the design of the intervention. Finally, it's necessary to remember that the core component are recognized in a situated manner and that although this research has already recognized seven core components in four central regions of Chile, it cannot be assumed that these are the same element to be safeguarded in all national latitudes. As conclusion, this study stands out for being a pioneer in the search of core component in the school mental health program in Chile and Latin America. Among its contribution, we can say that the study contribute theoretically and empirically generating data can be implemented in the local realities. In addition, this study, this study demonstrates that identify the core component of a mental health intervention in educational community is essential if the intervention outcomes are safeguarded. Since working in the community imply that intervention are subject to an adaptation, one way to protect a gain and wanted effect is to identify these core components. This will allow those implementing the intervention to know the essential element to be uh, to safeguard to ensure the success of intervention. The data obtained uh, in this research invite further research on the program, its implementation, and its effect on beneficiaries. In future, in future research or skill for life core component or other or any other uh, school mental health program, it's suggested to measure how much the element influence each other. This means the level of impact that each core component has on the rest of the core component. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, also for being perfectly on time. Actually, um, you had uh, a minute more. And uh, uh, of course, I invite the colleagues uh, to share their comments uh, and uh, questions in the chat or by, uh, by voice, uh, just unmuting uh, if you want. You are absolutely free. We have uh, six minutes, but of course, even something more and uh, yeah i i would start just with a with a i think an insight coming from the previous uh, to be honest uh, session but it's really adapted from my point of view for uh, for you uh, of course the methodology for community based research assessment and intervention as usually uh, require usually uh, an effort, a huge effort to, uh, to, be, uh, to, to, to be drawn and, and to be effective. But what about, uh, because in Italy, to be honest, this was and is a main issue, uh, especially 
uh, during COVID, but for mental health as well. Uh, what about to try to reduce the complexity of the uh, of the of the system? I mean, um, very frequently community, from a point of view, are um, actually scared and uh, scared by the the, the, the apparent uh, and sometimes real complexity of a problem. So uh, very frequently, to empower a community means to increase their self-efficacy, uh, to increase their, actually to internalize their locus of control, someone would say. You know? Do you think that uh, to find, uh, do you think that this, uh, this, this issue uh, is going to have uh, a role in your approach and could be solved, at least partially, by uh, what you presented to us. Just a, a reflection on, on this, if you think uh, it would be, um, uh, it would have a sense. Thank you. When I think about my work and my experience working with a national wide school mental health in community setting, setting I, there are some points, the relevant points, so we can pretend that the same intervention was made in the same way in around the world, around the country, no? So my, in, yeah, I'm interested in perhaps to pick up some uh, little, yeah, I mean, core component, but we need to safeguard some uh, activity, no, to to have the result that we expect. But um, yeah, this is a work that we are we are doing here in Chile because we have the police police in general. No, this program is a public program. So we need to identify that's work in this program and that doesn't work. No, so yeah, it's not so evident because we were um, to in, in all country. But yeah, and, and we know that the professional who were in this program um, implementing in different way. And this is a challenge for fidelity, for example. I first in, I think the adaptation is necessary. We can, it is necessary to be uh, uh, for, uh, yeah, it's necessary in the different city, no? Because the setting and population is different, but we need to safeguard sort quality of intervention. And that's the point, the, the sensitive point for us, no? So this is the reason why I asked me about the core components now, so yeah. You know, I, I agree that the intertwining of that component can be affected by culture. Please, Daniel. Yeah, I I was just wondering, um, Loretta, if you could give some examples of the kind of interventions, because it's it's very it's it's a it was a bit vague what what kind of interventions you you're talking about, and I think that would would help ah, me to okay understand. okay. Okay, the intervention name is the Spanish Habilidad para la Vida. In, in English, it's Skill for Life. It's a public uh, program in mental mm -hmm. health in the school. And different teams work with a specific school. In general, this school are a school with a low income, no? In general, it's more vulnerability population who attend this type of school. And the program developed different activity, activity in promotional health, no, for example, and preventive strategy. And the preventive strategy is only with a reduced number of children who have some difficulty in um, behavior in general, no? So uh, the program is structured in the three level of the world, uh, 
World OMA, the World Health Organization proposed. No, is the first level is a promotional level. The second level is more specific, is a preventional, and the last level is when you identify some children who have some problem in the school. You, um, I I forget the word, but you send these children to the care, spe specialist care. No. It's a low program, uh, it's a great program, a big program in our country for the school mental care in, in, in Chile and for children in general. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, I would suggest that I'm a little bit uh, disappointed because some of the speakers are not yet in the session, I hope they received the, the change of time uh, from yesterday. But uh, uh, wishing to uh, to see them uh, in a few minutes, uh, I would uh, uh, propose uh, to proceed with a video from uh, Deira Jimenez Balam and Lidia Serrata from the Universidad Intercultural Maya de Quintana Roo from Mexico. Uh, entitled Learning About Medical Plans, Research Experiences with Maya Children, Their Relationship with Environment and Community Contributions to Health. And uh, I try to share my screen. And uh, okay, maybe I can ask my collaborator to do it. Perfect. And uh, so maybe we can start uh, with the video. And, and I will present a research that we did, that I did with Media Serata. I will share my presentation. Uh, I will talk about learning about medicinal plants. Racial exper experiences with Maya children uh, the relationship with the environment and community contributions to health. Uh, in many indigenous communities, have a structural, a complex and dynamic way of understanding health and illness from their relationship with environment. Uh, in Yucatan, Mexico, there is a recent studies that documented how children know about medicinal plants and other ideas about health and illness. However, it's less analyzed the community contribution that children do with this uh, knowledge. And in indigenous communities, it has been uh, identified how children are community competent members that are integrated in family and community activities. Among Yucatec Maya communities, research has documented also how Maya children have access to a daily communities activities where they, where they observe and take the initiative to contribute and learn. In this uh, presentation, we will focus on our experiences of research with Maya children analyzing how their relationship with the environment promotes learning about medicinal plants used for treatment of common illnesses. And also we will focus on how Maya children use this knowledge about medicinal plants in, like a contribution to the promotion of health in their families and community. We did this research in the Colored Maya zone of Quintana Roo in Mexico that is located in the sud of Mexico. In, in this community, there are approximately 350 inhabitants. And most of the people work in traditional agriculture and wage labor. Uh, we worked with 10 children from seven to 12, to 12 years of age. Um, there, there were students of uh, elementary school in a small community of Quintana Roo, Mexico. 
And our focus, our perspective of research was uh, ethnography. We did four years of fieldwork and consisting in regular vis visits to the elementary school. We applied semi structural questionnaires with 10 children about medicinal knowledge. We also did workshops on botanical topics, including the uses of medicinal, medicinal plants. And our analysis was, was uh, using an ethnographic uh, analysis uh, in order to identify emergent coding categories. Our findings suggest that in our experience with Maya children, uh, let us to understand more about the environment where natural resources like medicinal plants are highly respected. In early years, children participate in ceremonies when they encourage when they are encouraged to respect natural resources. All the children in our students know how to create the majority of the illnesses they have recently experienced. The children identified 16 medicinal plants where the most frequent were the root and the sour forage. And how children learn about this medicinal knowledge? The first time uh, experiences when they get, were six is the main uh, way of how they learn. Also, when a relative in the family uh, was sick, this provide the context to create a learning ecology about medicinal knowledge that is characterized by the children observed during the illness treatment. And they also gathering plants in the home garden to prepare the treatments. Also, when they are present in this uh, illness situation, they listen and ask clarified questions about the treatment. And also, they have knowledge about how to identify post-treatment care. So the way on how children, uh, Maya communities organize their activities, like um, uh, where children can observe during the treatment of the illnesses, provide an environment in how uh, children contribute to community health. Helping during these situations, illness situation, but as considered, is considered a sharing household responsibility. It's expected that children help when it's needed, and this also is expected in a community level. In this sense, children contribute to a family and community level when they use medicinal knowledge in order to improve health. In conclusion, in the situations like uh, like uh, everyday activities provide the context of children's construction of learning technologies. It's important to recognize children uh, like competent agents in their contribution to community health. These, have, these findings also have implications in the building of conclusion, inclusion, specifically in the context of education and health. Uh, thank you. Okay, perfect. Actually, we appreciated together the work of uh, the colleague from uh, the University of uh, Quintana Roo in Mexico. Uh, hi, Coralie, nice to see you again. And uh, we, we were... And Andre Andrea? Yes? Um, sorry to interrupt, but no, please. Would, it be, would it be possible to discuss discuss this video even without the the presenter present? Of course, of course, it's it's very welcome. Actually, this uh, as I told in the previous session, we enlarged this uh, uh, this session in order to have a, a confrontation and possibly a discussion without uh, the author. Sometimes, is, but I think that the era arrived right now. Uh, if I do wrong, yeah, the Hira is with us. So, ah. welcome, Hira. Nice to meet you. 
Can you hear? Hi, it's Yes, nice to meet you. Ciao, Tejira. Nice to meet you. Greetings from Mexico. Yeah, nice to see you. Actually, we just watched your video. And with Daniel, we were actually thinking to discuss a little about your contribution, your very interesting contribution. So, actually, you appeared at the right time, definitely. <laughs> okay, okay. So, uh, of course, if you know your contribution, so please, Daniel, if you want, we have also data, if you want to share some uh, insights or, or question with the author, you have it, you have it. Yeah, because what, what struck me was, was their knowledge about and their involvement with, um, with medicine. When I think about a, we a Western a child or a child here i'm from israel like i think they would have no idea not just about no idea about plants but no ideas about uh, modern medicine as well they would just have their parents tell them what to take or what and they would not be asked to help so it was very striking that for maya's chi children they they are so involved and know so much Yes, yes, yes. That is the main difference between Occident children and Maya communities. And I think not just in Maya communities happen, it's, it's something usually in indigenous communities. So the difference, the main difference, I think, is that here in Maya in ecology, when they can participate and collaborate, and not, not it's just uh, individual task. They contribute to the health of the entire community because they interact with other families to find in some plant and interact with grandmothers and fathers. So it's a shared, it's a shared uh, responsibility. And, but they also know about the biomedical medicine. They know that this, uh, that if they have a flu, they can use medicinal plants or they, they can use a pill or uh, another medicine, the, the main medicine. But they think both are good and it depends of the illness or the disease. So it's very, it's very interesting the way uh, how they grow up in these Maya communities. And that that's it i work a lot about what they think about health and disease and they share many uh, beliefs from adults in their communities so they are expert in that thing and we sometimes don't think don't think that the children can create culture or do a child culture but it's it's very interesting how they learn That is our big our relationship with nature and and they learn a lot of things thank you <laughs> if there are uh, other questions for the era we are here otherwise we can proceed but of course the uh, as daniel suggested i think that more uh, important side of uh, a symposium is the connection between the participants. So the the uh, the works, the talks uh, should be. That's my point of view. An, a, a, an inspiration, uh, but with summaries from some results, we could get uh, common challenges, common methodologies, common insights. So thank you, Daniel. And of course, feel free. We are not so much to let your microphone open when you want to interact, but also to use the chat during the presentations. So maybe we could collect some common questions or considerations, and I, I will try to uh, facilitate, let's say, the connection between similar questions or similar uh, issues. Uh, I'm so happy so to see Ngobile, uh, uh, 
I'm so sorry if I'm, uh, I would not be able to pronounce your names in general correctly. Please forgive me. And uh, nice, to, nice to see you. Uh, and uh, I think if you, if you want, we could uh, uh, see your presentation. And, and so you could uh, share your screen. Uh, in the meantime, uh, I would like to remind to you and to the others that it uh, would be great to try to stay in 10 minutes, so to have uh, some time for a couple of questions. Oh, perfect. We can see it perfectly. And uh, Nkobile, uh, Nomonde Somi, uh, together with Jacqueline Akus, uh, are from the Rhodes University from South, South Africa and uh, are going to present a, a, a talk entitled Bonds and Bridges Between Community-Based Organizations and the Education Sector, the case of GADRA Education. Is that right? That is correct. Thank you so much, Chair. And apologies for my late arrival. I think the, the times changed and I didn't quite catch it in time. But lovely to be here. Thank you. We love to okay. have you. Please. Great. So as the Chair has so kindly introduced, my name is Mobile Nomondem Somi. I'm from Rhodes University. Um, in South Africa, and I'd like to acknowledge Professor Jackie Akust, who's busy chairing another session, so cannot be with us, you know, there's simultaneous sessions uh, happening. And today, what, what I'm presenting, what we're presenting, uh, similar to a theme that's run across a number of, of, of sessions during this conference is looking at the work of community-based organizations and beginning to theorize about their work uh, from the vantage point of community psychology to see what learnings there are, but also how to advance uh, the work. So I'll briefly share uh, about the case GADRA, organiz GADRA Education, which is a local NGO. I'll then speak about South African, the school education as a site um, that warrants our attention as community psychologists. I'll then speak to their techniques of counter resistance in the public schooling landscape. Uh, and specify what emerges as their community-based practice, okay? Before I get going, I would just like to acknowledge the contentious position that NGOs occupy. Uh, although the activities of NGOs have rightfully um, been challenged, they occupy influential positions. NGOs have played a key role with regards to siding with the persistently marginalized, um, as well as bringing about social justice following South Africa's colonial and apartheid histories and in fact, in our current democratic uh, society. So GADRA is an NGO that was established in the 50s, located in Makanda, South Africa. It was established to fill the gaps in service delivery by what was then known as the Department of Education and Training and advocate for institutional and political change rejecting the system of Bantu education, which was a law under apartheid enforcing racially uh, separated education systems. Present day, the organization was recently appointed, so this is in 2014, um, to manage Rhodes University's Vice Chancellor's Revitalization Education Initi Initiative. Uh, their bridging college called the Gadra Matrix School has been Rhodes University's largest feeder school since 2015. They've played a key role in the education landscape of the town and convened the principals forums, hosted parent workshops and meetings, 
uh, and trusted to lead a consortium of service organizations in the town. Uh, they're the town's oldest NGO and work in the context of persistent educational injustice. And you'll see uh, some of their recognition they've received for the kinds of work that they do. Um, in their diagnostic reports, our National Planning Commission identified unemployment and the poor quality of education for Black people, and I use that term in the Steve Beagle Black Consciousness conception of the word, so those two key uh, factors were um, identified as the top key challenges in democratic South Africa. So then education was positioned as central to achieving the overarching goals of eliminating poverty and reducing inequality. So then we see South African education as a site for the liberation and well-being of our country's uh, majority. But the discourse used to construct the state of education in our country is often discourses that center around crisis. We see this in the literature, the research, we see it in, in mass media. Um, the evidence for what is described as an ongoing crisis in South African education are the results from local and international tests of educational achievement, crumbling school infrastructure, poverty, uh, and inequality, lack of teacher knowledge, and low access to technology, amongst others, is further evidence to construct an unequal and broken education system. Uh, and Unik Spool, who's an educational psychologist, provides the anecdote we can see on our screens to capture um, some of the challenges, the challenge of, of what we face, okay? So within this national context, then we see Makanda, uh, and Makanda is located in the rural Eastern Cape province of South Africa, and it mirrors countrywide inequalities in the education sector. Uh, Makanda, that was formerly known as Grahamstown, is described as the cradle of education in South Africa. The town is home to so-called famous schooling establishments that appear in those top 20 list of most expensive and efficient schools in the country. Rhodes University, which is the university um, I'm affiliated with, sits on the more affluent west side of of Makanda, whilst one of our townships called Jawsa Township sits on the east side. Um, and here, fee-paying schools are located in the west, while no fee-paying schools are located in um, a more poverty-stricken east side of, of, of the town. And here we see the geopolitics as remnants of our apartheid state. Uh, providing an analysis of Makanda's educational land Unom Seng provides an incisive critique of education NGOs in the town. Unom Seng extends an analysis of NGOs dancing around the same spot to argue for zero sum philanthropy and are critiquing the techniques deployed by NGOs for legitimacy and survival. But the story doesn't end there because very recently what is described as Makanda's meteoric rise, um, metric rise is, is captured. I must temper that by saying, <laughs> you know, it's, it's relative and metric refers to our egg school exit level results and we've just um, just last year, there was an 83% pass rate, which is significantly better than previous years, and a 47% uh, bachelor pass rate. And a bachelor pass rate in South Africa enables um, access to tertiary education. And of course, you can see those uh, percentage rates are relatively low, but significant, okay? So then I was curious about uh, the, the oldest NGOs 
contributions and role in this landscape. So the study aimed to situate Gadra within this landscape and using a Foucauldian conception of discourse was used to consider the role of Gadra in social processes of legitimation and power. Um, we know that discourse is a site of power relations, it's the embodiment of power knowledge, it shapes subjectivity and experience and is therefore strongly implicated in the exercise of power. So I, I sought to highlight uh, these relations. Okay, um, and in the period, so the study period is 2012 to 2015 when the organization is repositioning themselves and I reviewed the annual reports and the strategic plan and what we see circulating is discourses of transformation crisis um, and the human capital discourse to construct the education landscape. Discourses of participation and collaboration were used to co-construct the mechanics and uh, Gadra Rhodes University collaborative partnership within public schooling and Gadra used techniques reminiscent of community psychology's principles and values to construct their credibility. We see social justice, participation, respect for diversity and human development, um, a keen ecological and sociocultural awareness, empowerment, social and peer support collaboration, partnership, as well as strength-based approaches embedded in their modes of intervention. And they positioned um, their intervention, their multi-tiered modes of intervention for bonding and, and bridging purposes, okay? We see examples of Gadra's bridging capital between school and higher education in Canada facilitated connections of exchange between members with shared interests that contrast social identities and this helped to build consensus among representing diverse interests and enabled the exchange of information ideas and innovation. We saw this facilitated through their Gadra Matrix School, their bursary program and mentoring programs. We also saw examples of Gadra's bonding capital between public schools in Makanda. And these schools have similar types of information and socioeconomic resources. Um, and so Gadra's programs fostered a sense of belonging and uh, facilitated collaborative um, action. Okay, and so it, it is Gadra's situatedness and their modes of intervention as capital for bonding and bridging purposes within the public schooling arena that has produced their cred credibility, okay, most importantly, and perhaps unlike other NGOs, it's, it's their credibility amongst community members, so learners, parents, principals, educators and local people that is noteworthy simultaneously they also gained credibility with Rhodes University as well as their donors. Their community-based this we argue is the operationalization of the principles and values of community psychology for transformative purposes it is community-based because it is situated they have a great awareness of the social context characteristics of Makanda, as well as an astute awareness of the matrices of culture, history, socioeconomics, and politics within our community. It is praxis because it is the application of theory through action tempered by reflexivity, and we see this, their modes develop over time to further sharpen their social action. And so we argue that their techniques have wider applicability for reform in the public schooling landscape in South Africa. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, uh, Gobile, and congratulations for uh, your job. And I think it's very fascinating and important. Uh, and uh, I would like to know from the colleagues if someone uh, would like to make you a question or has some curiosity or, um, or propose a, a connection. Uh, 
from my point of view, I'm really interested in uh, um, asking uh, uh, what are going to be the next steps of this, uh, of, of this approach. So what you have uh, in the future in mind, also in terms of, uh, if you want, methodologies or expected results. Yeah. So this, what I presented today, was an analysis of you know how the the organization presents themselves and how they track their modes of intervention. The next phase is to then gather the narratives of their alumni, uh, of their donors, of various stakeholders to find out you know their experiences of uh, interacting with the NGO and what that's meant for their lives. Uh, so that's phase. That's phase two. There is a third phase um, around the educational programs and using cultural historic activity theory to track. And one of the organization's goals is replicability. So we are hoping to document that uh, for others to learn from, but also to advance the kind of work we see happening there. I see. It would be, it would be really interesting keep in contact, uh, I will write to you maybe to let, let, let us update, um, uh, update us, sorry, uh, about the next step because I'm really interested in the results of this narrative analysis. And uh, maybe also to understand more what uh, is going to emerge from, from that uh, analysis. Yes, I'd love to stay in touch, yeah. Perfect. In my email. I will, uh, we will share, <clears throat> of course, uh, I, I have all your emails, so I can connect, uh, but also uh, between you, if you want, you can share your emails, uh, even if uh, we all belong to this, uh, to this world, so we, we would easily um, connect each other uh, where we want. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Kobile, and uh, I would, uh, Proceed. I would like to proceed uh, with Coralie uh, Merchera. Uh, I think it's from uh, Canada, the French part of Canada. So, Merchera, comme c'est dit? Mm -hmm. from, from Montreal. Ah, from Montreal. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, uh, actually, Coralie uh, is going to present uh, is, uh, from Teluk and uh, Ukam, uh, no, they look probably Coralie and uh, with the, your colleagues, Thomas uh, Salas from Ukam, uh, if I read correctly. And the first uh, talk of Coralie is uh, entitled The Role of Community Psychologists in the Relationship Between Health Institutions and Individuals, a Qualitative Analysis of Mother's Views on Message Promoting Breastfeeding in Quebec. Okay, thank you. Do you hear me correctly? Yeah? Yes, perfectly. Uh, again, okay. if you have more or less 10 minutes. I will uh, make you aware uh, about the time left. Please. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So, um, hi everyone. It's a pleasure to be here uh, online today to share uh, some work we did on breastfeeding. Um, Quickly, I would like to talk a little bit about the aims of community psychology. We are in a Congress in community psychology, so everyone knows about that. But uh, the aims of community psychology is to understand the individuals uh, in their environment, to understand the community in an ecological manner, and to understand society in a critical manner. So among the different areas of community psychology, one of them is the reduction of social inequalities in health, namely by promoting access to health services. In this context, uh, we see the role of the community psychologists to use um, as using their tools, analytical skills, knowledge production in order to promote equal access for all 
to health services by uh, one, for example, strengthening a positive relationship between the health institution, including professional working within them and services users, and two, exposing the power dynamics at play in those institutions. So the objectives of uh, my presentation, I would like to fill two main objectives. Uh, first, to present a study about the messages promoting breastfeeding from new mothers' perspectives. And by that, to present quick thoughts or question I have, we have, about how community psychologists can question hegemonic medical practices and discourses. So uh, as a quick introduction, breastfeeding is recognized as an optimal feeding method for babies and is reported to have a lot of benefits for the babies and for the mothers. For example, decreasing inf infant mortality, protecting the babies against various diseases and protecting the mother against breast or ovarian cancers. Regardless of the personal beliefs, health, uh, held by health prof uh, healthcare professionals, they have an ethical responsibility to encourage breastfeeding here in Quebec. Uh, their ability to support and encourage mothers has been shown to be related to the choice to breastfeed and the duration of uh, breastfeeding. After more here in Quebec, after more than two decades in, of intensive promotion, it would be almost impossible to miss the advertisements and discourses promoting breastfeeding that suggest that breastfeeding is the only ethically acceptable option in infant breastfeeding here in Quebec. Thus choosing not to breastfeed or not being able to breastfeed would represent a deviation from this norm. As part, as, a, as part of a research program aimed at, aimed at optimizing relationships between perinatal professionals and families, our team conducted an exploratory study to, ex, to describe the experiences of women exposed to messages that So the objective was to describe the, can, the content and the contexts in which messages were conveyed, whether they were congruent or inconsistent with mother's expectations or a mother's beliefs. A thorough attention was paid to negative experiences. And we did a study by a survey. We had a part with uh, quantitative data and a part with qualitative data. And the survey was about the perception, the mother's per perception about breastfeeding and their agreement toward uh, received messages. So um, we had a total of 944 new mothers, less than two years, uh, that respond, who responded to the survey. And um, the results showed that a large majority of respondents reported wanting, wanting to breastfeed their child, 94%, and that 91% breastfed them. Most women agreed with the messages they received. A large majority of respondents strongly agreed that breastfeeding was the best choice for their child. Um, however, some participants reporting being neutral or disagreeing with the message received. Uh, moreover, the content of the messages could sometimes be judgmental or coercive, sometimes leading to emotions such as guilt, and some participants uh, reported a lack of support when they expressed their desire to or their need to feed their baby in other ways, for example, breast milk with bottles or formulas. So I just wanted to, to dip a little bit more uh, within the results. We have uh, the positively received messages uh, that were about the importance of breastfeeding, the convenience of breastfeeding, the ease of this natural feeding method or the breastfeeding presented as a gift. So the mothers received those kind of messages and were agreeing with them and uh, every, everything went fine. However, despite the choice sometime left to mothers to receive information about breastfeeding or not, many respondents shared messages involving pressure 
our judgments. So as for the negatively received messages, a minority of our sample indicated they somewhat disagreed with the, with, um, the messages. Uh, the disagreements could be related uh, to the content of the messages or the doubt created by the lack of uh, scientific support from for the message or incomplete or incomplete <laughs> they receive. Some respondents uh, also mentioned. Some respondents also mentioned that the message could be restrictive. And I have a mother, uh, and I would like to share a quote from her, who said, "I would have preferred that they asked me what was my choice before giving me more information, and especially not insinuating that other options were not valid." Uh, so some respondents mentioned that uh, mother mental health was as important as the nutritional benefits in the breastfeeding process. And some mother reported that the postpartum difficulty they, they experienced were not adequately addressed. Um, so, so the women argued that the emphasis was not on the right message. While the message focused on the health and developmental benefits of breastfeeding, the message did not consider the mother's discomfort with breastfeeding nor their needs. Um, and beyond the context of the messages or the way they are delivered, women reported four types of reaction and lack of support from professional when they shared their decision not to exclusively breastfeed. Um, lack of reaction, no alternative information given, pressure, disruption, judgment, and even forced, physically forced uh, breastfeeding. So uh, as a conclusion, the difference between respondents who received the breastfeeding messages positively and those who received them negatively, and this difference seems to be positioned around two central points. First, consent to receive information or not. As we can see, many mothers receive the information without being asked about uh, if they wanted to receive it. And to the choice of the feeding method for their baby, referring that referring directly to the notion of agency. As stated in some research, the promotion of exclusive breastfeeding is culturally embedded and, influence, and influences professional practices and the latitude of decision left to women. In this context, respondents reported that the information they received was, was one-sided in favor of exclusive breastfeeding. Um, leaving them uh, with a difficult choice to deviate from this social norm um, and leading them to experience pressure. In our study, the pressure reported referred exclusively to health professional, but other studies reported a form of pressure exerted uh, by the women's social network reminding them uh, of their duty to conform to the social norm. And that's a study that we want to go deeper here in Quebec. Um, so the information about breastfeeding is strongly rooted in an hegemonic biomedical discourse, sometimes idealizing the psychosocial impact of breastfeeding, um, and therefore the support is uh, uh, always available or provided when women decide to slightly deviate from these medical guidelines. Thank you for your attention. Just as a quick... Uh, Final thought, the study highlights that the way health professionals convey the me their message has a larger influence than the content of the message itself. Uh, the perceived issue of breastfeeding messages was not the message itself. Most uh, women were okay with the fact that breastfeeding could be a good method of, of infant um, feeding, but the way in which information was conveyed. Right? The study highlights the importance of rethinking the way in which information is provided by professional in order to reinforce the autonomy of new mothers regarding the feeling of their child. And I'm wondering what is the place of community psychologists in helping such transition, a transformation? What is the place of the community psychologist, psychologist in changing the practice with the medical um, uh, care uh, teams and what is the place of community psychologists in rethinking the way we talk about breastfeeding and about uh, women's bodies. So thank you. Thank you, uh, <clears throat> Coralie. A very interesting work. Actually, I have a friend of mine that uh, 
uh, as an activist of breastfeeding here in Italy. And uh, so uh, I, I'm sorry to, to bring uh, an anecdotal experience, uh, of course, but it jumped in my mind because at least in my region in Tuscany, uh, in the last 10 years, there have been a lot of campaign uh, to promote breastfeeding. Uh, and actually, as community psychologist, I was always uh, argued, thoughts uh, uh, reflected about uh, the real effectiveness of this kind of polarization. You know, because from one side, of course, there's a message. There was a message. There was a, an attempt to increase the knowledge of people about it, to sense, to, to make them more sensitive to the to the topic. But from the other, I thought so frequently that uh, the narrative used to was so much similar to the political parties or, or to other kind of associations. And so I would like to know your point of view about this kind of approach in a globalized world where new technologies are so pervasive, where, you know, messages are uh, everywhere and it's really easy you know to make confusion from a point of view uh, between a political party uh, association promoting the right of hunters let's say and a very serious and more actually from a point of view impacting topic like breastfeeding what do you think about uh, the 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 choose or to inspire the narratives to, uh, you know, to, to promote uh, knowledge about breastfeeding, just starting from your, your work. Is it going to be possible? It's, uh, uh, it's not a problem, at least in Canada. What's your point? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for your intervention. What we see here in Canada is, and the women are telling that, um, it's one-sided information and it's a it's in a public information so breastfeeding how i how women do with their body is going public it's not a, a, a personal choice and if you want to do a personal choice you will be alone and you will be judged and maybe you will be physically Forced. And what we see here in Quebec is that it's a trend because in a foot for um, 40, like in the 1970, uh, breastfeeding was not a trend. Everyone was feeding their babies with bottles. So the, the question always is why it's changing and why it's so, um, so strong with this, those messages and how we can just put a little bit of uh, fluidity flow within the messages because it's a trend and who is at the at the base of the trend who is choosing what what trends is good or what trends are bad um, and the problem the problem is not the message themselves because women most of the women were okay and we have we had the a limit in this research because we had a lot of uh, pro breastfeeding leagues who responded to the survey. So we had uh, women who were uh, okay with the breastfeeding and who didn't have any problems with the breastfeeding. But we also have uh, women having problem with the breastfeeding. So, and most women were okay with the message about breastfeeding when it's not okay it's when they are forced and when they cannot breastfeed and they are judged by the professional or by uh, their uh, entourage and the question is, inter is interesting because who is deciding what is the trend and when the trends begin and when the trends and because in 1970, nobody was feeding their baby uh, by breast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And also the effectiveness uh, of different uh, narrative of different channels of different testimonial or influencer or mm -hmm. also different uh, um, trends uh, to be uh, uh, amplified is, I think, a question of uh, ignite or not. Uh, a certain dynamics. Mm -hmm. Well, it's really interesting. 
uh, of course, uh, uh, I would uh, I, I would love to have others' intervention. The chat is there for doing that. I would ask to Coralie to go in on with the next presentation. She has another work, and uh, uh, so we can have a uh, uh, final discussion, maybe also about the previous one. If you're okay, Coralie. Okay, so I'm continuing with my other presentation. Yes, please. Okay. Uh, because we have the last 20 minutes, but uh, we will okay. be able to. And the Perfect. next presentation is entitled The Life Story Approach as a Research Frame in Community Psychology, the example of a research on parenthood and physical disabilities. Uh, so please, uh, you can start when you want, Coralie. Thank you again. Okay, thank you. So it's more a methodological and um, a thought presentation, I some thought I wanted to share with you this morning. Uh, I'm not the first one to um, think about narratives and that's a word we hear a lot and that we heard a lot just uh, in this session. And um, yeah, I wanted to, uh, within the next few minutes, I would like to talk more about life story approaches and their relevance to the field of community psychology. Um, so as we know, research is an important tool in the practice of community uh, psychology and different epistemologies, data collection tools and different theory theoretical approaches shape the research produced in community psychology. While the life story approach is rooted in the fields of anthropology, education, and sociology, uh, we were, I was, we were as a research group wondering how this approach can be also relevant to community psychology. So that's a question that we have for some years now. Um, so uh, this presentation will focus on uh, two main uh, objective. First, uh, I would like to quickly lay some groundwork for the life story approach, in particular through semantic and methodological work on the notion found in the literature about life trajectory, life story approaches and narrative approaches, for example. And two, we uh, would like to exemplify the role of the life story approach in the transition to parenthood through uh, the presentation of quick thought from a study on access to perinatal and early childhood services for parents with physical disability. Um, that was the, the research I, I did for my uh, doctoral thesis in uh, community psychology. So uh, first, the terms uh, about the definition and the relevance of life stories approaches, the terms of the terms biographical, uh, bio, biogra biographical um, approach, life story, life history, life trajectories or narrative approaches, sometimes in the literature seems to be replaceable in the scientific literature. Uh, so we have found various uh, research using life story inspired methods, uh, not many in community psychology, but as I said earlier, uh, a lot in sociology and ed education, and they seem to use the words um usually life history life trajectory life stories uh, but sometimes in different meaning and sometimes in the same meaning so th this is kind that we found kind of a blur around those definition so we chose life story or life story approach uh, as a methodological uh, tool so the life story is also a theory theoretical approach, uh, and we have chosen to insert uh, this approach in a constructivist and critical paradigm and a, met a methodological tool. So as, as for the method methodological tool, uh, the life story is a non-directive qualitative method used to understand a human phenomenon embedded in a particular time frame, such as identity construction, social trajectories, or cultural changes. Um, and that's 
uh, interesting for a community psychologist. Uh, in, in pursuit of a research objective, the life story approach involves asking people to share their story or just a part of it, depending on the research question, in order to generate scientific knowledge. The life story is a particularly important data collection tool in research involving um, a temporal dim dimension such as the transition of parenthood that's one of the research i did or the reproductive trajectory that's a other part area of research i'm interested in a life stories allow for different levels of analysis different processes from individuals to communities or institutions. So there can be a mutual influence between these different stories or these different narrative, uh, individual community institution. Research life and stories are both, um, are used both to understand how an individual has developed in themselves, but we can also put the life story into a more social perspective, which could be quite interesting for community psychologists aiming at developing an understanding of communities rather than of individuals. It is indeed relevant to approach the life trajectories of individuals or communities and the story they tell about, about it to identify the key moments in their lives and the action levers that can be put in place to strengthen their well being, psychological well being, physical uh, well being, and social well being, for example. So, as for uh, the example I wanted to share with you, is it's a research um, on parenthood and physical disability. Um, and we try to uh, to insert this research in individual narrative, but also to uh, take a step back for, from the individual narrative to have a more community uh, narrative. So in this research, uh, 13 in-depth interview inspired by the life story methods were conducted with parents with different physical disability. And with uh, these methods, we were able first to understand the personal stories surrounding parenthood in different situations, uh, different physical disability, everyone uh, facing uh, different barriers, different um, strength as well. And two, we were able to gain a more complete understanding of the recurring barriers faced by these parents, which allowed us to understand a group of people rather than just individuals. And with that, we were able to come to go to the uh, health institution and to um, present the barriers and to, and, and to also um, insert participants, uh, parenting experts in a larger story they decided to share with us and to give a more complex view of their situation. This approach, uh, both uh, theoretical and methodological, proves to be relevant for an in-depth understanding of how parents with physical disabilities are received in services and how potential discrimination and encountered may hinder their access and well-being as parents. Thanks to this approach, we have been able to notice the richness of the information contained in this type of data collection, leading us to take an interest in the potential of life stories as a research material in community psychology. So when we approach a parent, uh, when we approach a person and we ask uh, him or her to share their parental experiences and embedded that uh, within a life story, it was more easy for them to go deepen in their experience and to share um, more precisely and more complex in, with more complexity their experience and how they were um, living and navigating through that and navigating through the health care uh, system. So we are now continuing our work with the research about reproductive coercion among women with disability and for this project we are trying uh, to pass through the um, individual stories to, to directly go to more uh, community stories by, by doing focus group with uh, women with physical disabilities, uh, speaking about their uh, reproductive trajectories. 
So um, in order to have a more comprehensive and a more complex and a more complete understanding of people's life, the life story approaches seems to be a valuable method that needs to be refined and used in more research setting, especially research on important and determinant moments in human lives, such as parenthood transition for me, but I can think about many others. Um, so that's that's it for today. I think that social change asks for a change in the narrative. So I would say that uh, methods or narrative oriented could be a great way to continue our work as community psychologists. Thank you again, Coralie. Very interesting this reflection. Uh, actually, I would really love to have discussion about this but uh, we have the last uh, uh, the last talk which is a video from a colleague from uh, uh, Sofia University in Japan so I would since it's 12 minutes we are going to be uh, to have a little delay for the next session so I would suggest to have this also this experience and then, uh, unfortunately, we have to start the next symposium. We have a very crazy day. Uh, I'm, I was really glad to be here. We are, you are a lot. And I think that uh, the chat can be a, a, a good opportunity to exchange uh, emails uh, or also uh, insights. Uh, so I'm really sorry for not having time for this discussion. But uh, I hope that there is going to be an opportunity uh, in, the, in the next future. And so let me share my screen and uh, to, uh, in order to can see together the last contribution of this session from the Dr. Tanaka Shio uh, from the uh, University of Sofia in Japan. My study is about religious differences of the mechanism of depression recognition cause attribution and coping behavior, cross-cultural comparison between Indonesia and Japan. So the study is about mental health literacy. And today's topic is uh, like this. And I'll start from the introduction. So there are needs of cultural adequate mental health service for Indonesian Muslim in Japan. There are four reasons. Uh, before COVID-19, rapid increasing rate of Indonesia in Japan. And cultural differences between Indonesia and Japan uh, regarding from religious uh, perspective is huge. 90% are Muslim in Indonesia and 80% are non-religious in Japan. And the, these cultural differences cause mental health risk of Indonesia in Japan, like cultural stress, uh, adaptation difficulty, and religious prejudice. And fourth, even though they have risk, uh, they have cultural barriers of seeking help from professionals. And another kind of topic, a symptom recognition effect on seeking help from professionals. The symptom recognition is about recognition of mental illness possibility and causal attribution. And symptom recognition effect on seeking help from professionals is unclear. Some researchers say the recognition of mental illness possibility directly from seeking help from professionals. On the other kind of researchers say, cultural attribution has rather important effect on seeking help from professionals. So a recognition of mental illness is indirectly affect seeking help from professionals. So to solve this problem, we need to look at the mechanism of the effect on seeking help from professionals. And it is also important to see this mechanism because uh, it is known that there are cultural differences 
is a recognition and cause of attribution and coping behavior to mental illness. For instance, Indonesian and Muslim shows religious attribution and religious coping towards mental illness. But we still don't know why this cultural difference happened. It's a lack of literacy or a cultural effect. We still don't know. So it is also important to investigate the mechanism. Uh, we set the model like this, mental illness recognition toward causal attribution toward coping behavior. Purpose of our study is compare the mechanism of depression recognition, causal attribution, and coping behaviors between Indonesian Muslim and Japanese non religion but there are two questions. Uh, first one is this, is mental illness recognition directly affect on medical coping behavior or mental illness recognition is rather indirectly coping behavior, affect coping behavior. And second uh, question is, is mental illness recognition uh, affect what kind of causal attribution and what kind of causal attribution affect what kind of coping behavior when you add causal attribution, a religious causal attribution and religious coping behavior in this model. And what kind of difference can we see in when you compare Indonesian Muslim and Indonesian Japanese to this model. Uh, we conducted an online survey at Tokyo and Jakarta, both in capital of Japan and Indonesia, uh, to university students, and we exclude the other kind, other effect of culture. And these are the measures we used. So first, participants have to read this uh, minute, depression minute, and ask the recognition. And the participant who can discriminate depression from other kinds of mental illness get a highest score in this scale. And for a causal attribution, there are three factors, psychosocial attribution, biological attribution, religious attribution. And in coping behavior, there are four factors, religious coping, seeking help from professionals, seeking help from family and friends, and evil despair. And for demographic variables, which might affect our results, we measure eight, age, gender, educational history of psychiatry, financial status, psychiatric consultation history by themselves and by their families, and counsel, counseling history by themselves and by their families. And according to chi-square analysis and t-test, we only found that religious religiosity showed larger effect size in demographic variables. So we conclude that there are not that much demographic differences between Indonesian Muslim and Japanese non-religion. And to test the model, we used uh, 12 variables. Eight of them are uh, depression rec uh, are related to depression recognition and cause attribution and coping behavior. And other four is control variables, which is educational history of psychiatry, religiosity, self-stigma for seeking help from mental health professionals, and psychiatric consultation history by themselves. And we made test the model and we got the result. So we have two questions. First one is this. Is mental illness recognition directly affect on coping behavior 
uh, medical coping behavior or not. And then this is the result. So depression recognition did not directly have positive effect on seeking help from professionals, but depression recognition has positive effect both in psychosocial attribution and biological attribution. And these two directly positively affect seeking help from professionals respectively. And so to answer seeking help from professionals, raising the recognition of mental illness is not enough. The causal attribution plays an important role for promoting help-seeking behavior. The raising the knowledge of psychosocial attribution may affect it in both Indonesia and Japanese culture because the, the path shows not significant both between Indonesia and Japan. And raising the knowledge of biological attribution may more affect Asian culture because the past shows significant difference. And when you look at the number, Indonesia mostly have a larger effect on this past. And uh, we also have this question. And the answer to this question is this one. So depression recognition also have positive effects on religious attribution, but only in Indonesian Muslim and not in Japanese non-religion. Also, when you look at the biological attribution, um, biological attribution has positive effect both on people dispelling and religious coping only in Indonesia, Indonesian Muslim. Also, in Japanese non-religion, depression recognition rather have negative effects on evil dispelling and religious coping. So the religious attribution and recognition coping were also seen in Indonesian Muslim. But since depression recognition enhanced religious attribution and religious coping was promoted via religious attribution and biological attribution, the cultural difference seen in Indonesian Muslim could be explained not the lack of literacy recognition, but the cultural effect. Former studies show that Muslims tend to use religious open to all kinds of stress and has been reported the effect of Islamic intervention for decreasing depression and anxiety. So prompting both knowledge of religious and medical attribution and coping behaviors may culturally adequate for Indonesian Muslim. On the other hand, in Japanese depression, in Japanese, depression recognition wasn't enhanced religious attribution, and rather the recognition decreased religious coping. So in, in Japanese non-religion, religious attribution or religious coping towards depression symptom could be the lack of literacy. So for future study, is it's need to investigate with different samples, such as Muslim as cultural minority, Muslim in different region and other religion groups. And also need to acquire multicultural competency and the mental health professionals in Japan to meet the needs for Indonesian Muslim in. Okay, uh, I would like to thank you uh, again uh, very much. There's uh, the other symposium that we start uh, at 
list uh, as soon as this will end. <coughs> so thank you all of, to attend and uh, see you maybe later. Have a nice morning, night, uh, afternoon, and uh, see you later. Goodbye.